we were in an exclusive Luke story about the ten lepers in, in his 17th chapter. Well, I went back one chapter to another exclusive uh, Luke story. It's only found in Luke. Um, and it's, it's the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Hmm. And it's very interesting, I was thinking about it, that in you know, all my uh, years of ministry, whatever that's been, it's not like I've deliberately stayed away from the passage. At least I don't think so. But I've always realized that it can be misunderstood very easily and you end up, you end up someplace that I don't believe was Jesus' intention at all. And we can do that because there's certain things that really fascinate us. You know, heaven and hell and different things. And as soon as anything that even gets close to those subjects is thrown out, off we go and running. The whole thing with the rich man and Lazarus is one of those things that's it's still disputed whether it was a parable or not because Jesus never used names in parables. And in this story, once he starts talking about the rich man and Lazarus, between Lazarus, Moses, and Abraham, it's, it's filled with real people, which causes some people to think that it's a real story that Jesus is talking about, a real Lazarus, a real rich guy, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Russ, would you go to Luke 16? and read the 14th verse. This is kind of the verse that prompts the story, just so we know. It's always good to know why did Jesus you know, break into that. This, in Luke 16, 14, Jesus has gone through some different parables. One of them had to do with money, and um, there was a warning that he gave us about money. In Luke 16, 14, would you read that verse? Now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and they were scoffing at him. So we've, that's, that's the situation that we've got, is Jesus has told these parables, and money has been a part of it, and they love their money, and they're basically mocking him. So we end up getting this story that some people look at as kind of like a, you know, they see the Lazarus and, and rich man thing as kind of, uh, you know, Jesus using scare tactics, you know, that there's consequences if you don't, you know, give to the poor and you're not caring and all that, uh, you'll end up in hell. Um, I hope we all recognize that's really bad theology, that we don't end up in hell based on whether we give to the poor or not. We don't end up in hell depending on how uh, selfish we are. Our destination is not based on how many people we fed. Our destination is based on what Christ did, and that's it. He's done it, and we put our faith in him and what he's done for us. Um, last week, we had said that there was that point where the ten lepers are walking off and they see that they're cleansed, and one of them, the Samaritan, returns. It's like decision time. Nine of them make a decision to carry on, the one makes a decision to go back. I think that this particular story also has a kind of a decision time to it. But I really think at the heart of what Jesus is talking about is really is one of the main things I think, is faith. He's talking about faith. It's very obvious where the rich man's faith is, and it's very obvious, I shouldn't say it's very obvious, I think that as the story unfolds, we see where Lazarus' faith is by virtue of where he ends up, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, but I do, I, I've read, I read a book, if you ever want to read a really good book on the Trinity, it's The Great Dance by C. Baxter Kruger. It's short, it's not too long. But he writes something about faith in here that I think is a really good way, a really good thing that he says. He says, Christian faith is not something we do that gets us connected to God or gets us into the circle of life shared by the Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus Christ has done that. Faith is, faith is not something that we do that moves us from the unforgiven column to the forgiven column. That was done in Jesus. Faith is not something we do that gets us reconciled, justified, included, adopted, redeemed, saved. Jesus Christ has already done all of that for us. The fundamental character of Christian faith is that of discovery. Faith, as Martin Luther said somewhere, is like the eye. It does not create what it sees, it just sees what is there. I like that line. Christian faith is first and foremost the discovery of what the Father, Son, and Spirit have made of the human race in Jesus Christ. Faith is the discovery that there and then in Jesus Christ we were reconciled, saved, adopted. There and then in Jesus Christ 
we were cleansed and born again, recreated and taken home to the Father. And there and then, in Jesus Christ, we were welcomed by, by God the Father Almighty, embraced, accepted, included in the circle of life. Christian faith is first and foremost, foremost a discovery of truth in Jesus, the truth about God and the truth about ourselves, the truth of our identity, of who we are, a discovery of the fact that Father, Son, and Spirit do not live out their dance of life without us. And that is a discovery that commands us to believe it as truth and to rethink everything we thought we knew about ourselves and others and our lives and theirs. That is a discovery that commands us to live in the dignity and joy and freedom of the truth and to recognize no one according to the flesh, as Paul put it, as a mere human. For as C.S. Lewis has said, there are no ordinary people. I like the way he comments on faith, that basically, in faith, you see what you never saw before and all that God has done for us. Um, we're going to be in Luke 16, and we're going to break down the story into three sections. Mary, do you have it there in front of you, Luke 16? Would you read verses 19, 20, and 21? Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. We immediately, Jesus starts this story, whether you believe it's a parable or not, he starts the story with serious contrast. You've got a rich man, you've got a poor man. Some translations would say beggar, but we never see him begging in the story. It's not a beggar, it's just a word that means a very, very, in, in Greek, a very poor man. He was a pauper. And uh, so you've got a rich man, you've got a pauper, extremes. You've got one with no name, you've got one with a name, Lazarus. And Lazarus, his name actually means God is helper. And as Mary just read, he was desiring to be fed the crumbs. He never says a word. It doesn't sound like he's begging. It just says he was desiring. When you look at verses 19 through 21, you can't help but see the contrast between the men that are presented. And this rich man, we're not told that he makes any ovations at all to do anything about Lazarus's condition. He appears, anyway, to be numb. It appears as though he doesn't mind Lazarus being outside his gate. He knows he's there, but he's like a non-person. He knows he's poor and needy and full of sores, but it doesn't matter because he's dressed nicely, he's eating nicely, he's doing fine. They don't present the guy as mean or vicious or anything like that, just numb to the needs of somebody who's right outside his gate. Now, we're not going to get into it, but the scriptures, it's kind of interesting. I don't know why, it's just the way it is. In the Bible, you can actually find 12 different uses for the word dogs. A dog could be uh, a literal dog, like we know dogs. Or in the past, we've said how dogs is used uh, to refer to Gentiles. Um, if you remember in Matthew 15, the woman uh, asking Jesus, and he says, you know, about the dogs and the crumbs falling off the table to feed, you know, the dogs, uh, referring really to Gentiles and that, and that whole thing. There's 12 different uses, and I've put them in the notes. I'm not going to go through them. The point is that this was a literal dog, or dogs, plural, that would come and actually lick his sores. Now, because of the way the Jews viewed dogs, like we said before, dogs were not a domestic pet. They were animals in the street. They would eat garbage. They would feed off of dead animals. If an animal died, that was the dog's dinner. So it was not like it is nowadays at all. And for a Jew, if a dog licked you, then it made you unclean. Sort of like the lepers last week were unclean. They were supposed to yell, unclean, unclean. Well, Lazarus, by virtue of laying there, and being licked by dogs, he was constantly, they were get, even they were eating more than he was, quite frankly. They're licking his sores, and that's making him ritualistically, ceremonially, however you, whatever you want to see it. He was unclean. He wouldn't have been touched by any Jew. He might as well have been a leper outside that gate because the dogs were licking him. But there is something that is interesting 
that it said that he was laid outside Lazarus or uh, the rich man's gate. Whatever the extent of his illness and the sores and everything were, he couldn't really get around. So we couldn't really see him as someone to say, you know, get a job, would you? It was obvious he was in rough shape. But somebody, or maybe more than one, I don't know how big the guy was or how, it took the opportunity to get him to a place where he would be visible to people and perhaps they would be moved with compassion to help this guy, to do something, give him a few bucks, whatever. Somebody was carrying him, got him to a place where somehow people's hearts would be moved to do something about it. It doesn't appear the rich man was moved to do anything. We have other spots in scripture. Remember that story in John 5 when Jesus is walking by the pool and he asked the guy, do you want to be made well? And the guy says, I have no man to get me into the water. I've got no one to carry me into the water when the water's stirring. That little story. Nobody wants, I, I need help and I can't get the help. Or you get, a, you get the other story. Do you remember when they lower the guy down through the roof um, because it was so crowded around Jesus? It says Jesus was preaching and teaching. And it was so crowded around him, the guy who really needed to get to him couldn't get to him. Now he had four guys carrying him, but he couldn't get to him. And it's a fascinating picture, because it's a great picture of the church, how everybody is gathered around, their backs are to, are to the people who need Jesus. They can't even get to him. They're all mobbed around him. I know we would say, but they were listening to Jesus. Um, if nothing else we get out of Jesus' teaching is, I'm really happy when you listen to me, but it's, that's half of what is necessary. The other half is to do what you hear. Remember, a wise man is one who hears and does the word of God. James talks about someone who, do, who hears and does the word of God. Hearing is only half of it.